The water's fine, homie, jump into the deep end. So it you will reap it. We talking how to start it, how to grow it, how to keep it. Take a deep breath. You are now rocking with founders. Hello, hello, Jason. Good Hi, to have you on the pod today. Yeah, psyched to be here, man. So Jason's in Charlotte. I um, went to school there and then started a company in Charlotte. You know what's funny about Charlotte? I'm curious what your take is on this is when we were there trying to raise money, everybody was like, get out of here. Like you're nobody, which is true. Um, <laughs> but then, then we got into this accelerator in New York. So I, I moved to my new, New York and my co-founder stayed in Charlotte, but we changed our LinkedIn location of the company, you know, from Charlotte to New York. <laughs> And right. then I started reaching out to the same people that like didn't invest in us for two years nonstop. And all of a sudden they were like, whoa, you're in, now in New York. Like things are happening. I want to invest. So it actually attracted more investors by leaving than by <laughs> staying. And Interesting. I'm curious, what do you think of that? <laughs> because they're still there. Yeah. Well, I mean, Charlotte's an interesting, interesting city. You know, it's... um it's a financial services kind of a banking city or has been historically it's changing, which is, which is good, I think, but you know, it's, it's a kind of, you know, I think, I think as it relates to kind of big fortune 500 banking investing, I think it's got a lot that, that it kind of is centered on here. You know, when it, when it relates to kind of, it's not known as a town for startups. It's not known as a city for, you know, a lot of founding businesses. It's not known as a big venture kind of oriented area. So it's, um, but it's growing out of it a little bit, you know, I always like to say there's, there's like a, there's a Charlotte welcome package. If you're a young, a young professional guy that includes a, a Patagonia vest, a pair of all birds and a, and a BMW three series, man. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much what, that's the welcome pack. But, you know, so I, I'm not, it's, but it, it hasn't historically been done as an entrepreneurial sort of center, but I think it's, it's changing. Nice. Uh, so, so today, today's part to be a little bit different. Uh, you're, you're a founder yourself, Jason, uh, mm -hmm. on the investment side. Uh, but, I, but I think a lot of today's uh, talks or a lot of today's episode will be about um, may, maybe the M and A side. From you know, Flavio and I have both uh, started companies, sold companies, um, and. I, you know, we have our perspective, but, but I think that you have a different kind of perspective. And so mm -hmm. I think that'll be more of the focus of today. Um, so do, do you want to give like, what, what, what are you doing nowadays and how'd you kind of get to, to the firm you're, you have now? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a, an interesting journey. You know, I, I have one rule in life, which is, you know, change things up as often as possible just to keep it interesting. So, um, you know, I started, I mean, professionally speaking, I started out as a classic investment banker out of school, went into an analyst program at Bank of America um, for, you know, people in your audience that are sort of familiar with that world, you know, pretty much kind of a down the middle type experience. You know, it's uh, it's a crazy, hardcore, super stressful, you know, insane world, but it's a great training ground for really understanding companies, how to actually break a company down, analyze, you know, its market, analyze its market position. So it was a good place to start my career. Um, and then I kind of continued it. I, I've gotten like sort of progressively entrepreneurial throughout my career. I went from a very large company, Bank of America, then I moved to a private hedge fund in Miami where I ran capital markets there for about six years. We did a lot of really cool stuff, you know, really interesting kind of things. We were right in the middle of the whole securitization, CBO, CDO, credit default swap stuff in the early 2000s. Um, you caused the financial recession? Yes. So I, was I, that I you? Personally, <laughs> listen, Man. I won't I won't deny that we might have had a role in it. I'm not going <laughs> to sit here and be dishonest on this podcast, but uh we were uh, we were happy to push the envelope. I'll say that. And um, but from a finance kind of career perspective, it was it was really interesting because we were we were literally inventing new securities, you know, all the time that, that were then we'd have to go out and market those to institutional investors. And, you know, that gave me, again, a great experience of understanding, well, how do I take something non-traditional? And how do I explain it to, you know, an audience, especially when it has a, a complex and kind of a technical 
construction to it. Um, so, you know, that, that was, I think also a beneficial, you know, experience for me. And then I left, I actually, you know, got out of, of that world right before the, the crisis in 08. So I'd love to say I was more good than lucky. I'd say I was more lucky than good. Um, but then I, I kind of had made that decision that I wanted to go on my own and become an entrepreneur and kind of work for myself. And that was sort of the, the line there that, that was, you know, where I went in kind of away from what I call the W2 world and into the founder owner world. Um, it was interesting, man. You know, the first couple things I did were, were really outside of my wheelhouse. You know, I, I started a, a helicopter leasing business after I had learned to fly helicopters and kind of in my off time um, and invested in, you know, gold mines in, in Panama and then started or actually bought a company that really modified businesses and homes for, for wheelchair access. <laughs> so just kind of all over the place, you know, kind of my initial foray is into, into working for myself and, and being an entrepreneur and, and to answer specifically your question, Taylor, that eventually I, I was sort of led back to a blend of the two worlds, you know, kind of an entrepreneur, but also that investment banking kind of world that I started with and then started, you know, basically doing M&A investment banking advisory work um, about six years ago for lower middle market, you know, companies, primarily founder owned businesses across a lot of sectors, but eventually kind of started to really concentrate uh, in consumer um, and things in and around digital consumer. So in the e-commerce space. So today I'm, you know, I'm a founding partner of GW Partners, which is an investment bank in that world, and also a founding partner of a brand uh, accelerator, basically growth fund um, that also kind of you know, really takes founders and businesses, hopefully kind of under our wing and helps really try to create a lot of tailwind for those businesses to the ultimate goal, which, you know, in those cases is, um, potentially selling the, the company down the road. So it's a, I know Flavia and I both have friends kind of loosely in this space. And I know this is kind of a tough time in the direct to consumer e com world, right? It, like the margins are getting squished. There was so much money flooding this that, you know, a bunch of these businesses were getting bought and sold and tons of brands flooded fulfillment by Amazon and all that. Like, what, what, yep. what are you kind of seeing uh, today versus, let's say, two or three years ago? Yeah, and I think, you know, as you're probably aware, there was a lot of capital that was raised to invest in um, e-commerce oriented companies, you know, a lot of them being brands themselves, but also other kind of ancillary businesses in and around that, you know, ecosystem. Um, you know, really on the on the back of, of the pandemic where we had such a massive run up in, you know, move to online kind of sales from from traditional brick and mortar. And then, you know, we saw obviously a reversion to the mean over the last, say, year or so. Um, and you know, I think there's been a lot of lessons learned in the, in the, you know, in the process, especially by people that have put a lot of money to work that, you know, frankly, are, are, are seeing that money um, producing, you know, negative returns at this point. So, you know, I, I think what happened was it, it became a bit of a bubble, um, to be frank. And you know, a lot of of companies, a lot of assets, you know, that were what I would consider middle of the road, maybe, you know, not not terribly strong um, were invested in or purchased. And as market conditions turned, those weaknesses in those businesses became apparent, started to show themselves. And um, and then eventually, you know, with with a lot of the, the money that was raised, it was heavily leveraged. So you had a, you know, a really kind of lopsided capital structure with a ton of debt. And then everyone knows what happens with leverage, man. Like on the way up, it's awesome. On the way down, it's brutal. Can you elaborate on that? Because, you know, I, I find that um, a, a lot of us kind of talk in code around these words, right? M&A, yeah. leverage, debt. C can you like make it simple um sure what, what what does that mean like what, what what does it mean when somebody has high leverage like what and what are the downsides like what, what do you mean like what are the downsides today of that yeah so i mean in simple terms if you think about just a, a capital structure right it, it usually consists primarily of two components it's it's equity and it's debt so you know in the case of let's say let's say i'm i have a a fund that has been raised to go and acquire uh companies and I've got, 
500 million dollars of, of assets under management or call it funding really dollars to go spend so if the 500 million is is composed of say 400 million of debt and 100 million of equity then you know that's a you know that's kind of a, a highly levered capital structure where your debt to equity ratio is is four to one which in a lot of the vehicles that i think you're alluding to taylor um, it was even say more levered than that, six or seven or eight to one, sometimes 10 to one. So say for a $500 million fund, there may only be $50 million of equity and, and you know, 450 million or, or so in, in debt. So what happens is, you know, when you're borrowing that money in the beginning to make, to make acquisitions, um, everything is fine. But as you're borrowing that money, that, that debt has to be serviced, right? So there's a lot of times interest and principal payments that are due uh, on that debt. And so if the assets, you know, that you're acquiring start to, you know, cash flow less and less and less, then you don't end up having enough cash flow to cover your debt obligations, which are very large as a ratio because of the initial ratio of debt to equity. So... In, in short, you know, it, it turns into a cash flow problem where you can't service your debt because your companies, let's say your revenues are declining because they went up, skyrocketed, they peaked in the middle of COVID and it started to come back down. And your revenues say were $500,000 a month at the peak and now they're $250,000. Well, you know, the acquisition uh, valuations, a lot of them were done when the revenue was 500,000. So that's where things start to, to go south. And then, and then you end up in a scenario where even if the actual companies themselves, are, you know, let's call it they're, they're savable or they can kind of turn it around in terms of like a decline, they can plateau and maybe start to grow again. You oftentimes run out of, you just run out of time hmm. because the debt holders want to be paid and the cash just isn't there to pay them. And so you end up with, workout scenarios and and you know you end up with mergers of necessity rather than you know choice and overall it just it serves to depress valuations as all this is happening so you advise companies that want to be sold correct and it seems to me like you've done this or you're doing this for different entities, Providium Group, South Coal, Global Wire Advisors, and GW Partners. Uh, can you explain to me the difference between those four things? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, GW Partners actually is effectively, we, we recently rebranded. That was Global Wire Advisors. So they're one and the same. And really the, the what difference- the reason for the rebrand? Yeah, I would say it was a it was a pivot a little bit in our kind of our model. You know, what we we used to be very traditional in our M and A engagements, which were kind of transactional in nature. You know, where someone would come to us and say, "I would like to go to market and try to sell my business today," and so we would go through a very traditional relationship. Like Wait, one what of the size things, of business? We're oh. in the lower middle market. We're typically between ten and and a hundred million revenues. So that's the normal size for our client base. Gotcha. Um, so this average for us is to 30. 10 to, I see 30 million revenue often say, sounds like specialized in e-commerce type deals. Correct. And consumer and kind of related. So for example, ecosystem SaaS businesses that are, you know, kind of serve the consumer e-commerce market, logistics businesses that serve the e-commerce, you know, consumer market those things, you know, gotcha. as well. So you're helping these companies and then what caused the pivot? Really, it was two things. I'd say one is, you know, as we were kind of going through this, we, in our kind of our early history, you know, we were, we always would lament the fact that we weren't really able oftentimes to get involved with the clients early enough in the process where we could get in and actually make, you know, real impact you know, on their businesses operationally in order to kind of drive even further value in the process, right? We're always, they're kind of coming, you know, coming to us, kind of wanting to move forward and, and sell their company uh, immediately. 
And, and what we've always felt like was, look, we would rather get involved with companies much, much earlier than at the sale point where we can help impact and really drive change within the business that's much more strategic in nature. So that was, you know, the can, primary can, reason can, can is moving example? away from that. Like, like what, what, what do you, yeah. like, what's an example? Like, what, what do you find that the operators or the entrepreneurs are not doing that by you stepping in or you helping them, you can kind of force the change that needs to happen? Sure. Yeah, I would say, well, first of all, it, it's kind of, a, you know, thinking, thinking about every aspect of their business strategically with respect to um, an acquisition. So first of all, putting yourself in the acquirer's shoes, right, in a simple kind of, I'd say, um, way. And looking at, you know, whether we're talking about finance, operations, product development, human resources, going through all the core functions within a business and saying, look, how is an acquirer going to view my company in these different building blocks? What are they going to see that says, hey, this, we don't really like this. This, this doesn't feel like it's, you know, efficient or it's ideal. And the other, I'd say, key part is understanding you know, what is your real, what is your place in the market and what makes you special or unique? What is your reason to exist? You know, and the reason why that's important is a big part of kind of an exit or, or acquisition process, which I'm sure you guys certainly know because you've been through it, is kind of showing potential acquirers the future of what this can be, right? What, what's its current position? What is its future position likely to be and why should you care, right? Why does this matter? Why should you want to own this company as either part of yours or as a standalone kind of investment as it relates to, say, like a financial, you know, buyer? So really, I'd say that that's really where it begins, where a lot of a lot of founders, most because most don't really come from an M&A background. They're not really trained to think about their businesses in that way. So they're thinking about them. How do I just be the most successful operating company I can be every day, right? They get up every day. That's what they're thinking about. They're not thinking about, well, you know, if I structure my uh, marketing department in this way with this type of employee versus, say, this type of outside service provider, how is that going to be viewed in an acquisition? Is it going to drive value up or is it going to weigh value down? Can you give an example? So does this having a marketing employee help me in selling the business or using a contractor? Well, I would say that, you know, it's actually case by case, but to be, but to answer the question, really strategically speaking, more often than not, when a company is being sold, the team is an important part of that business. Sometimes when an acquirer buys it, they want to obviously get rid of the team. They have people that perform those roles already. They're going to replace the current team. That's, but that, I would say that's the, the minority of cases, not the majority. So what you want to do is you want to build teams that have really attractive um, people at the top that are strategically important. And then as the you know, caught org chart gets down to more and more junior levels, it becomes less strategically important. So for example, you know, I would I would advise, you know, a lot of consumer products businesses to have a internal, really solid director of marketing or CMO. But then often in the kind of call it the size range of companies that we work with, kind of that again, 10 to 100 million, it's much more efficient to then outsource certain functions like, you know, paid ad spend, you know, paid search, paid social kind of um, activities rather than bring that in house. Um, but having an internal director of marketing who's really pulling the strings, who understands the overall direction of the company uh, much, you know, much better and has a very kind of vested interest in it. So, <clears throat> so I still, if you don't mind sharing, uh, I don't understand why after building this brand global wired partners for several years investing so much in that what caused you to change the brand to gw partners yeah i think i think a lot of it is around the word advisors versus the word partners right i think that's really where it, it comes into play because you know i think 
what we what we wanted to do was we wanted to change up the way that we worked with clients away from kind of that traditional more advisor type of relationship to become much more of a of a partner type relationship i think that's really what kind of we wanted to really hammer that home um because i think it's easy to say that right it's, it's easy to say hey we partner with you you know we're here you know right next to you arm in arm but it's another thing to actually structure re your relationships in that way to where you're you know we're getting involved with clients much earlier and we're actually you know inside of their businesses helping execute right so there's a clear distinction there and and i think you know it's one of the things we wanted to do differently um you know and and to for, for no other reason we enjoy it more we enjoy being along for for a much larger part of the journey so yeah i guess traditionally the the advisor side were you guys by the way certified broker dealers no we didn't need to be how did because i've learned this kind of along the way in that to really advise a company you know, be to do, be the investment bank you'd have to be a, a certified broker dealer but if you structure the agreement is more of a consulting type arrangement then you don't um so is that is that kind of what i mean i guess did you guys get a percentage of the of the transaction price before effectively yeah we we do yeah and so yeah i think there's you know there's basically sec kind of no action letters and, and other things that kind of govern the relationship here uh, which ultimately makes you exempt from needing kind of FINRA status in what we do. Um, you can still have arrangements and engagements that where you're getting paid a portion of the transaction that don't require um, you to be a registered broker dealer. So, so you know, it's just understanding you, that. You don't do, or, or you're saying with the partner side, you, how, how are you, you charge differently? We do. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're working with us, it's, it's usually going to be on a, on a consulting basis. Um, the engagements are structured. It's kind of like if you took a traditional kind of business consulting type of engagement and, and kind of included, you know, some, some M and A advisor type features in it as well. I'll be honest with you as a founder, I'm extremely skeptical of these type of arrangements and, uh, especially since the on both sides on the on the banking side and we've paid the fee of I think it was four or five percent of the transaction to people that didn't do anything to build a business but were, were helpful in the few months of transaction it that uh, if things go well they can drive up the total price and buy more than their fee uh, but I guess I'm 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 more skeptical of the side of, on the advising side of, you know, how do you advise companies? You know, it, it feels like, you know, the, the, the saying of like, those who can't do teach that thing. And I, I was a teacher in high school for a little bit. So I, I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, right. guys, I do think there's a certain domain expertise you gain by doing, by building companies that they don't buy advising companies. I guess, how do you, how do you feel about that? You know, in that, you know, yeah. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. I, I think that if, if all you've ever done in your career is, is advise businesses, I think that you're likely missing a piece of the picture for sure. So, you know, I think that, you know, what we like to say and in, in, is that we, we've kind of had every seat at the table, right? We've been, We've been the, the founder, we've been the, the seller, we've been the buyer, we've also been an advisor, right? So we, we know what kind of every angle is and, and kind of what every angle looks like. You know, we, you know, we've basically built our own businesses. So we understand from the inside out, you know, what it takes. But at the same time, we also understand that, you know, when you're, we're trying to, to sell a company, you know, there are clear best practices and how to go about doing that. Right. And so, yeah, I think that's um, I think that there's truth to that for sure. So I think that, you know, and, and I think with founders, what I'll say this too, you know, as as someone who's played, obviously, the investment banker role, the consultant role, as well as the owner you know, role, I would say that, you know, empower yourself um, as much as possible 
in terms of understanding how these kinds of processes work. Right, I would say take it upon yourself as, as you know, part of your responsibility to kind of be your own corp dev department, right? In a way, be your own kind of M&A internal department and, you know, surround yourself with not only information, but, you know, people that can help you, uh, you know, along the way if there are skills that you don't really possess. So one of the things I always tell people they should have, regardless of really the size of their business, is have an advisory board, right? Have, a, have, have people that are actually there that, you know, you know, are there to kind of really have your best interest at heart that you can bounce ideas off of. And I would suggest that anyone who's thinking of, you know, exiting their company any with, you know, anywhere within five years, that the, there are people on that board who have done it, who have sold companies, and who can help them, you know, help this founder understand, you know, what what it really takes to do it and what kinds of things they should be thinking about. How do I find, I, I you know, especially when, when I was in Kentucky, I, it was hard for me to find these people, right? Or or if I did know them, um, wh why would they join my board, right? Like, like I, th I think some of these things are easy to say, but hard for an entrepreneur to figure out actually how to do, right? You know, do, do they reach sure. out to somebody like you? Do they say, hey, Jason, you could you should come join my advisory board. Like, how, how do you recommend if, if one is thinking of selling their business in the next five years, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs would love to, but a very, very small minority actually get to, um, how would you recommend they actually do that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, first of all, I, I would say you'd be surprised how many people would be interested in, in doing things like that, right? I would say, I mean, I meet far more highly successful, experienced people that want to kind of, you know, help others and help people that were in their shoes, you know, let's say, you know, 10 years ago than, than the other way around. So I think, first of all, people are actually more willing to do these kinds of things than, than I think a lot of people think, number one. Number two, I think, I think it's, you know, on top of just the traditional, hey, networking and making sure that, you know, you're, you're trying to kind of build a community, both, you know, whether it's just on LinkedIn or whether it's, you know, through masterminds or, or other, you know, groups or, or, you know, going to conferences, trade shows, really trying to build your network of people that are in and around, you know, the industry that you're in. And then not being afraid to reach out, right? And saying, hey, by the way, I'm putting together an advisory board and I really think that you would be a great, you know, addition to that. I think also it helps you to have some financial incentive. You know, I would, you know, set aside some advisory board shares, you know, in the company. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it is good. It's a good um, incentive for people to want to, you know, spend their time um, helping you. So I think that's the thing I would I'd absolutely do. And, and, and more often than not, those tend to, be good investments. If you carve out 5% of the equity in your company for advisory board shares and, and even just pull together a four or five person advisory board and give them each a percent, you know, that's a that's likely going to be, um, we'll call it equity well spent. Nice. What kind of, can, can you speak to um, mistakes that people are making uh, entrepreneurs specifically, maybe because in my experience, if somebody raises a bunch of money or, or they have investors and they're probably kind of in this ecosystem, but maybe more for bootstrapped people who, you know, they started a business by themselves or with a partner. Um, they haven't raised any money or very, very little money. And they've been just going along, right? They, every day they wake up servicing customers or, or f fulfilling orders or whatever it is that they're doing. And they find a business that is worth something to somebody. What what kinds of mistakes? Like, what's the top mistake you see someone like that really making that that's hurting hurting themselves? I mean, I would say that the two biggest ones are one, you know, I'd say thinking about it too late, and number two, I'd say not thinking about it strategically. So, as far as the too late goes, well, it it's very difficult to reverse engineer a company where you're starting it from day one with the intention of, I know exactly where it's going to go and who I'm going to sell it to in five years, right? Or six years or seven years. That's, that's really difficult. And a lot of times you end up missing the fundamentals of just building a good business. That's usually not why businesses get started, right? So when I say too late, I don't really mean like, oh, you should have been thinking about this from the very beginning. 
But what I do mean is I think if you're if this is something you're starting to have an interest in and saying, hey, you know what, I have a successful company. I know that one of my choices, you know, with this company is to sell it, you know, one day. That is a clear indication you should start thinking about this, you know, process. And not only that, but think about the things that are going to be important to making this happen. I mean, I I say it all the time, and you alluded to it, Taylor, that you know, selling a company is something that's actually quite rare. Even rare is selling more than one company. And normally, if you sell a company, the vast majority of times, that's going to be the biggest financial event in that person's life, more more than likely. So it obviously deserves a lot of care and a lot of forethought and a lot of planning. And so instead of just, oh, you know what, accidentally, I heard the market's hot. Let me call up a broker, see if he can hurry up and sell my company because I heard multiples are good. Normally, that doesn't lead to what I would call an, you know, an optimal outcome. So, you know, really, and aside from just saying, oh, I got to plan for it, well, what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to plan for it? Well, I think it means a couple things. I, I talked a little bit about just breaking your business down into the fundamental, call it modules of the company and understanding at each level, am I building this company in a way that's going to make it an attractive acquisition target, right? Strategically, because that's in, that's what people should be striving for if they want to sell their business is selling it to someone who gives it a high amount of strategic value, right? So and, and related to that is really understanding your position, right, in your market. Why? I always ask people, why should you exist, right? What's your reason to exist? And if you have a really strong reason, say, I exist because X, you know, and it's pretty compelling and somewhat protectable, then that's a good indication that, you know what, you probably have a strategically valuable position in your market. So now it's time to kind of build around that and exploit it. If you don't answer that and you have a hard time, well, I'm kind of like the other guy or I'm kind of like this guy or we did something a little bit different or a little bit better. You might have something that for now gives you an advantage. Odds are the advantage will go away, right? Because it doesn't feel like a very defensible position or something that's kind of long lasting. So I think it's time. I think it's being you know, really kind of conscious about this and being very strategic about your thought process. And the other thing I always say, and I've, I've heard others say this before, so I can't take credit for it, is like have an idea, like have a top 15 like potential acquirers for your business. Like if you're a founder and you don't at least have some names out there that say, hey, I think so-and-so or this company or that company or this fund would really like me or would really potentially you know, want to acquire me then I think you, sh you should do it. Like that's, that's, it's thinking a little bit like an M&A banker, right? As a founder, but, um, but it, it's going to help you a lot. So to, to your point, Flavio, like empowering yourself, right? I mean, there are different people and potential service providers in this process that have value. So bankers how, sometimes have value, but sometimes they don't. I, so in my last business, I really struggled with some of this, like I ran a digital marketing agency. When you ask people, ask me questions like, what reason do you have to exist? What's your mission? All, all these questions. The answer was, I don't know, man, we just like build websites. We, you know, and I think the truth is that that's a lot of businesses, right? You know, the, 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 yeah. the person running the hot dog stand downstairs doesn't have a reason to exist. He just wants to feed his family. So right. that, does that mean that a business like that, if I don't have a reason to exist, um, I, I'm not going to be able to sell for a lot of money. Um, yeah. And, and like, I, I understand this business. I don't, I don't have that. Um, also how does one, um, like if I think if I want to get bought by Salesforce, how do I, you know, as a normal person kind of penetrate that very, like, how does one action that step of, okay, what do I do now? Sure. Oh, well, I'll answer the first part first, right. It's sort of like, well, what if I don't have a reason? So, you know, everything that I'm talking about is kind of this optimal potential like endpoint, right? But we know that as, as is the case in a lot of parts of life and business, there's a spectrum, there's a scale, right? There's, and, and things occur all along that, that spectrum. So, you know, it doesn't mean your business isn't a sellable business. It doesn't mean that there isn't a potential buyer for your business, right? What it does mean is, you know, if, if, you know, kind of there's the optimal and then there's kind of things below that. So, but 
you're right. A lot of people can't answer that question. It doesn't mean that, oh, I can't exit my company. But what it does mean is that, you know, when you're looking at it from a, an objective perspective and you're saying, hey, I want to prepare my business and make it as good as possible for the process, you know, I want to look at it in this way. How do I how do I optimize these different things so that they become more strategically valuable? Um, and I think it's also I mean, look, we don't need to get into a valuation tutorial on this call, but or this pod. But, you know, there's obviously a big range of how companies get valued and, you know, Let's say you don't have quite maybe the strategic um, jewelry, if you will, that uh, that another business may have, but you have a lot of value. You know, you have a solid customer base. You're growing. You have good margins. You know, you have a you have a spot in the market. You know, your valuation just may be a little bit lower than, let's say, you know, business X that that is is sort of what I would call maybe more of a unicorn, if you will, but. In terms of finding out, I mean, there's different ways. I mean, the, the short, easy first answer is just, you know, researching and, and making yourself aware of what is going on with these potential acquiring businesses, right? Now, in an ideal world, what you would do is you would reach out to them. You would try to make contact, even with someone, you know, just maybe more junior on their corp dev team. And and that that was like, oh, if you're feeling like, well, maybe I'm not big enough. Why would they care? Why would they want to talk to me? You know what I mean? But the thing to remember is, especially groups that are charged with looking for acquisition opportunities, they love to talk about potential acquisitions. They love to talk to companies that might one day, you know, one day be an acquisition target. Like you're not bothering them to talk to them because this is what they do all day. You know, they look for opportunities. And so if you reach out and just have a conversation, just say, hey, look, I'm, my company's not for sale, but what are you guys like? What are you doing lately in, in, in your acquisition strategy? Like what's interesting to you? Like, you know, what what kind of things are you guys looking for? These are not hard conversations. And you'd be surprised at the reception that you get if you just, you know, be proactive about it. And it's literally well, that. Go ahead. Buddy. I'm curious, how do you get customers like um for you and then one of these companies or two it really is perhaps enough revenue for a year and so it's like hunting whales and you're competing with i would assume like investment banks with more resources yeah, yeah. like <clears throat> goldman yeah. sachs or, or even smaller smaller ones with more resources so how do you go about even finding these people Finding customers on, on our side, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, look, I mean, purely from a tactical perspective, right? I would say, you know, you kind of have your your garden variety tactics in terms of, look, we, we try to be in, in the public sphere as much as we can, you know, telling our story, telling our approach. You know, we do a lot of, I'd say, you know, speaking at conferences, on webinars, you know, going on shows like this, of course. Um, that's a big way. We have a lot. We have a big network in the in the market that refers us people all the time. I'd say that's a big that's a big source of customers for us. We still have though. We have cold email reach out campaigns. That's a that's a part of what we do um, as well. So I'd say between those three things, those are those encompass probably eighty to ninety percent of of the client base. You know, you ever get those get. emails? I used to get these emails all the time. It's like, hey. Are you looking to sell your business? <laughs> and, and it turns out to be like this young, I don't know, 20 year old or 25 mm -hmm. year old. Right. They tend to message like older people that like are like looking to retire selling their business. Oh, and like, baby, like the baby boomers. Yeah. 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 And they're like, and they have a fund behind them or honestly, often they don't have anybody behind them, but if they find the business, then they'll go get the actual funder. Yeah. Search funds, they're called. Is, there, yep. have you, is this a thing? Like, are you? Oh yeah. Do you guys do this or who? Like, no, are you sending the emails? No, I mean, <laughs> no, we're not. We're not sending those emails, man. Don't blame me, buddy. Those are mine. Um, it's a, it's a big, yeah, it's a big thing. I mean, I, and it got even bigger. I mean, again, I, I don't want to turn it into a, a macroeconomic TED talk, but. We're in an interesting part. Like we just came through a really big bull cycle in M&A, right? I mean, across the world, across sectors, across everywhere. And now you're in a very low cycle in M&A. 
your volume is much, much lower. So what do you do, especially if you're in the business? Like, what do you do now? Those same companies need the revenue or, or uh, the, the same banks and, and advisory firms still need to to live. So how, what do you do? Do you pivot? Like, what do you do? Well, within our core business, I'd say, you know, we're boutique enough and we're small enough. I mean, we'll have 10 to 15 clients at one time, right? So in a bull market or a bear market, like we don't really have an issue kind of keeping our client roster full. You know, that's not a problem for us. It is, a, it can be a problem for much larger institutions who like in order to support their, you know, cost base, they need a hundred clients, they need 200 clients, right? So we don't have that issue, bigger institutions tend to, right? And then that's that's when you see, just like any other cyclical uh, phenomenon, you see people reducing staff and, and doing less deals. And, and the thing about investment banking though, is, as you probably well know, is it's very bonus driven. So, I mean, for people in an M&A group at an investment bank, 80% usually or more of your comp is in a year end bonus. So that's the other way that, that this gets kind of dealt with a little bit is bonuses just get completely slashed, right? So maybe, you know, if you got $100 last year, this year you're going to get 40, you know what I mean? Or something like that, because the group, they don't want to get rid of people in the group because they're really talented, but there's just not enough volume and the fee level isn't enough to support large bonuses. Nice, nice. Well, um any other kind of last words of wisdom for for for, for those? I, I know you've covered a number of topics, but any other sure. kind of words of wisdom? And also, uh, I know you're not a macroeconomist, but where, where do you see things uh, in the next twelve months? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll answer that one first. I mean, I, I think our view is if you look at it, kind of where we are in the cycle, we're, we're probably going to see sustained higher interest rates what what that does is you know it, it, it reduces available capital it actually reduces um you know let's call it the overall uh, capital available to do deals right and the cost of that capital goes up so you see valuations basically get you know really weighed on because of it at the same time we've got a credit crunch so not only is the debt higher priced it's less available so that's just further exacerbates it right you also have a consumer that is likely to get worse before it gets better. Um, and probably a technical recession here in the next, call it six to nine months. So I think what you're going to see is, and the way M&A cycles work is that actually you see them slow down a lot right before you go through a, an economic down cycle, like a recession. Hmm. Then when you're about halfway through and kind of you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, then you see M&A volume pick way back up because that way everyone feels like, well, wait a minute. I kind of I realize we've got more call it choppy water, but I can see the future a little better. So I want to buy now before valuations start going back up again. So you get all this rush of capital. in. So I think all this plays out over about the next 12 months. I think you're in kind of a lower M&A kind of volume cycle for probably another six to nine. And then you start to see it pick up. And when it does, it's probably going to pick up a lot because the one thing that's um, still very much in existence right now is even though you've had a tightening of credit, you have a lot of cash on corporate balance sheets and NPE funds, private equity funds that really, really wants to go to work. But right now it's a little bit, I'd say, conservative. So as soon as you get a little glimmer, I think you're going to see it. Uh, you'll see it pick up substantially. So my last, you know, I'd say advice really is really just look. As a founder, you know, you kind of owe it to yourself if, if you want to sell your company and you want to you know, do it the right way to just think about it early and just try to think. And if you don't know how to do it, you know, find some good people that can help you do it and kind of be your own advocate. You know, don't rely solely on other people to help you through what is call it the, the most important probably business event you're going to have. Excellent. Well, well, we'll wrap with that. Really appreciate you coming on, Jason. Appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you for rocking with the homies. Taylor, trusty, and Flavio. Seize the day. Own it. Until next time. Hold it down. Hold it down.